Well, if you have your Bibles, open them up to Exodus chapter 30. It's good to see all of you. And I can see all the men in the room that are going to show up to our Champions event. Come on, somebody. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so we're going to card you next week. Anyways, uh, we would not do that. We would not do that. I want to read something and get started with something that's really important for your life. And uh, also, I want you to begin to see a glimmer of what God is wanting to do, has done in your life, also how he wants you to live your life. So I'll begin in verse 22 of Exodus chapter 30. It says, Moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also take for yourself quality spices, myrrh, sweet-smelling cinnamon, sweet-smelling cane, verse 24, cassia, and a hin of olive oil. And you shall make from these a holy anointing oil and ointment compounded according to the art of the perfumer or the originator. It shall be a holy anointing oil with it, and I add to that, the holy anointing oil, you shall anoint the tabernacle of the meeting and the ark of the testimony. You shall anoint the table and all of its utensils. You shall anoint the lampstand and its utensils, and you shall anoint the altar of incense. You shall anoint the altar of burnt offerings with all its utensils and the laver and its base, and you shall consecrate them that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them must be holy. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister to me as priests. And you shall speak to the children of Israel saying, this shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on man's flesh, nor shall you make any other like it. In other words, no substitutes according to its composition. It is holy and it shall be holy to you. Verse 33, last verse. Whoever compounds any like it, in other words, makes a fake, uh, uh, attempts to use a substitute in the place of the real, or whoever puts any of it on an outsider, referring to a disrespectful, carnal, irreverent, dishonoring person type, shall be cut off from his people. Now, this is God's recipe for the anointing oil. It also gives you insight on a word and a phrase that sometimes is used and not understood called the anointing. For many years, for many, many years, ever since Jesus rose from the dead, the conversation and the important conversation that a person must engage is the anointing that's on our lives, the anointing in Christ Jesus that's on your lives. You can see here, you know, again, the Old Testament is a type and shadow, but uh, it was made out of quality ingredients or quality, or it's called principal ingredients, the best that the land had to offer. It was precious in the sight of God. It was regarded in the, the hearts of men. At least it was supposed to be. The anointing was used to, of course, anoint kings. It was not just a ritual. It's not just a, a religion. Something actually transpired. Something actually took place on certain occasions and on certain people. And there's real power that takes place when you and I receive from God's word the understanding of how this anointing affects your life. Because the anointing, of course, you know, we refer to him as Jesus Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's a description. It literally means the anointed one and his anointing. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. The anointed one and his anointing. It's, it's important that you and I understand that, that we... Uh, get a hold of that for example in first corinthians chapter 1 verse 20 it says for all the promises of god in him are yes and amen to the glory of, of god through us now he who established is us with you is christ the anointed one and his anointing and has anointed us and who has anointed us is god whether you realize this or not, we're going to 
uncover some things, you are anointed. Turn your neighbor and say, I knew that. But that's pretty much the response that people, that you get from people that don't understand the importance of the anointing. Now, I'm not saying you're not intelligent. I'm not... Yes, Lord, I'll move on. <laughs> so a number of messages have been done. One that I heard of that, uh, and it's been repeated on so many contemporary ministers, and it goes like this. The anointing makes a difference. And why I'm picking that is because the anointing on your life does make the difference. I'm not just talking about a little dab of oil here. So let's, let's, let me kind of help you. How many of you understand that there's a difference between singing and anointed singing? There's a difference between preaching and anointed preaching. Come on, somebody. There's a difference between having church and having an anointed church service. How many know there's a difference between going to the marketplace to receive something from a vessel that's anointed and someone who's not? How many know there's a difference when it comes to the anointing? Everyone say the anointing makes a difference. It's important because the anointing does make a difference. Without question, it is what you and I need to have that difference in our life. The anointing is not just for people in the ministry although you are a minister if you're a Christian, but it's not just for the pastor or the prophet or the evangelist or things like that. The anointing makes a difference in the marketplace. The anointing makes a difference in a marriage. The anointing makes a difference, you know, in a relationship. The anointing makes the difference. You see, it, see the anointing will make the difference with the gifts and the cause he's placed upon your life, he will make you become more productive, more effective, more powerful, and more fruitful. What makes a difference in the Christian, what may, or I should say what makes the Christian effective is called the anointing. Say the anointing. For example, it says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, it says, but you have an unction from the Holy One. The word unction means anointing, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. In 1 John 2, 27, it says something like this. It says, the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. That same anointing teaches you all things. Now, in the Amplified Bible, it reads fabulous. I pretty much quote this oftentimes, you know. It says, but as for you, the anointing, the unction which, which you have received from him, permanently abides in you his anointing teaches you now you have a permanent work of god's anointing say i've got the oil tell me you never say i got the oil <laughs> see the the anointing oil or i'm just going to refer to it as the anointing is when it's behind someone there is an unction to function in a way that you could not function without the unction Turn your neighbor and say, I got an unction to function. And that word unction, you can look it up. It just simply means to quicken, to, to make alive. It causes you to have an ability that's beyond just natural ability. It's what, it's what graces you. You can tell it's a work of God in you. And the anointing is pretty simple. I mean, we've talked about this for a number of years now. It just means to smear, to rub into, to rub over. And it comes with the beautiful fragments. We might get to that. But the Lord told Moses, he says, take a hen of oil, which means it's about five or six quarts. And when you anoint someone, you give them a, a, a five to six quart dousing. Come on, somebody. That's called an outpouring. That's called a saturation. That's called a drenching. <laughs> That's not a little devil, do you? Come on, somebody. And the, the anointing is, is, is at saturation. You know, I, I read about, you can read about it when you read in Psalms 133, where it says, you know, behold how, how good it is and uh, how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. But then it goes on in verse 3 and it says, it is, the, it is like the precious anointing oil upon the head, the running down the beard, the beard of Aaron running down the edge of his garments all the way down to his sandals, verse three. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. Anyone say that's fresh? It goes on to say, 
for there the Lord commands the blessing life evermore. There's something about the anointing. There's something about when you're in unity, not just with your brethren, but when you're in unity with God, there's something about a freshness that comes on you. There's something, and it says here, when Aaron was anointed, this is a picture of Aaron being doused. He's being saturated under the anointing. You know, why is that? Because the anointing makes the difference. Say that. The anointing makes the difference. You know, the last couple of weeks we talked about what Joel said. He said, I will pour out my spirit. Well, the Lord said it through the prophet Joel, and then Peter repeated it to all flesh. And, uh, and it's important that you understand that we're talking about the anointing. We're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit. Today, God wants to stir that anointing up on the inside of you. The anointing is for everyone. Tell your neighbor, it's for me. See, and you can and God does expect you to walk in the anointing. Why? Because the anointing makes the difference. You know, there is something that the anointing does in us and through us. It pulls the best out of us. You need to understand that the anointing brings out the quality, the principal life, the quality life, the best life out of you. It goes beyond the limitations of your natural being. The anointing takes the gifts and the abilities that you have that may be dormant on the inside of you. And God, when God anoints it, there's a freshness that comes. Every person needs to be anointed afresh again. Every, every person has to have various experiences with the Holy Spirit. Whatever he put in you, he'll bring out of you with the freshness and with anointing. The anointing brings the best out in your worship. It brings the best out in your praise. It brings the best out in your ability. It brings the best out of your gifting. It brings the best out of the words you speak. Help them, Jesus. It brings the best out in your attitude. It brings the best out in your behavior. It brings the best out on your job. It brings the best out, come on, with your family. It brings the best out of you. See, the anointing, see, if you ever try to do something that God gave to you, a family, a child, a relationship, a gift, and you don't apply the anointing, you're not going to pull the best out. The anointing makes the difference. Say that. The anointing makes the difference. It's important. Now, God deserves our best, but he doesn't ask you to give you best out of fleshly work, human work, natural work comparing yourself with somebody else and how they look and what their build is and what their physique is or what their age is or what it's not or what skills they have. No, he's asking you to understand how you're built. You're built to operate in the anointing. You're built to bring out the best of what we put on the inside of you. And it's important. Now, it would say fresh oil. When God anoints us and you are anointed it's on the inside of you the holy spirit lives on the inside of you but you need to understand that there are times that you got to have that fresh anointing that fresh oil that fresh work of the holy ghost <laughs> are you with me so it says so david said this he says but my horn that word horn means strength some of you are feeling weak today that's why you came some of you are feeling down today, that's why you can't, because God's going to do something on the inside of you that you don't have the ability to do on your own. But my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. Now that's just the picture right there. Anyways, I have been anointed with fresh oil. Everyone say fresh oil. Say it again. What are we talking about? He says, I've been anointed with fresh oil. Now there's a lot of Christians today that have lost their freshness. And I'm sure they're online, and I'm sure they're here in this room. They've lost their freshness for one of two reasons, maybe even be a third. One of them is because they've allowed their freshness to grow stale. Or number two, they've become tainted with a circumstance or challenge in their life. Number one, too many Christians have grown stale in what God is trying to do in their lives. They show up at church, but there's no freshness on them. Their anointing has been tampered with. I'm, go I'm going somewhere, just trust me. And uh, it's important that you and I understand it. Have you grown stale? You gotta be willing to ask yourself these questions. You say, oh, no, 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 I remember. No, you're referring to an old anointing. Not that in that moment it wasn't fresh. 
But that's why the Bible says, we mentioned last week, Paul said, be being filled. There are fresh anointings. And David says, you know, Lord, you have, you have exalted me with a fresh, with fresh anointing or with fresh oil. See, technically, many people, it's just a past memory, not a current reality. They can think back in 19 whenever or 2000 whenever when they were touching. That was real and that was powerful. But they've never gone back. They would never sought. They would never pursued. They never looked. They never prayed. They never asked for that fresh anointing. <coughs> so you need to understand what makes a difference in your life. And what I want you to get is the anointing makes the difference. Say the anointing makes a difference. See, when things get stale on the inside of you, this is what Solomon was talking about when he said, dead flies putrefy the ointment and cause it to give off a foul order. You ever seen a Christian with a foul order? I'm, I'm just talking about those that don't use deodorant. I'm talking about they just have a foul attitude. Come on, somebody. Their mouth is foul. Their attitude is foul. You know, they act one way here. They act a different way somewhere else. Come on, they're foul. There's something wrong with the mechanism. And, uh, and another translation says, dead flies cause a stench in the mixer's anointing oil. Now, why I'm bringing this to your attention, because I know what the adversary would want to do in your life. He want to tamper with your oil. He wants to mess with your oil. He would love for flies to die in your oil. Now, you need to understand some of the things where I'm going. Help you to get a hold of them. See, if you don't have fresh oil, then flies are going to be attracted to it and they're going to die there. Now remember, it's important that, that we hear what it says. Dead flies putrefy or stench the anointing oil. God is the originator of the anointing on your life. Not men, not denominations, not religion, not you. Okay, so we need to have that fresh anointing. That freshness. How does a person stay fresh? God's doors are always open. Anytime you knock, he will answer. Come on, somebody. But most people lost their pursuit and lost their hunger and no longer want that fresh anointing. I'm here to tell you, you can't live without the anointing. You got to be careful. Here's where the trickery of the adversary tries to come in. But what I want to refer to is that there are, unfortunately, some Christians that are are, are, are truly born again, but when you let that freshness go stale, you become repulsive in your attitude or you become rude. This is where the, you know, they, they know better, they just don't do better. So they become repulsive, they become rude, they become mean-spirited, they become jealous, they become envious, they become critical, unkind with their words, sarcastic, you know, demanding, dominating, manipulating. Come on, the list goes on and on and on. See, that's that old smelly stench of religion, I like to call it. There are a people that carry themselves. The Bible says in Titus 1.16, they profess to know God, but in works they deny him, detestable, disobedient, and, and disqualified from every good work. There are reasons why certain things in the kingdom of God don't go forward. See, the anointing makes the difference. If you're not going to depend on the anointing, but all you're going to depend is on your flesh, your human ability, you're not going to go far in the things of the kingdom of God. You can fool some people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time, especially if you're that one. Anyways, it's important, but it says here they profess to know God. There's a lot of people who profess to know God that don't believe in the anointing. They profess to know God, don't believe in the power of the blood. They profess to know God, but they no longer linger on the name of Jesus. They profess to know God, but don't read his word. They profess to know God, but they don't have a prayer life. They profess to know God, but they have no conviction. They profess to know God, but they have no repentant life. There's no humility. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him. You see, no, those are the people that Timothy also talked about when he said they have a form of godliness, but, but denying him in the power thereof. And then he says, from such turn away. The hypocrites, the false, those that don't have a pure heart. You know, they get so used to making their mistakes, they just don't have any more resistance. Be careful. I know of people that are just incredible with talent, incredible with gifted, but also been a long time in the church 
And because they keep going back to the same thing, go back to the same thing, go back to the same thing, and they, all they ever say is, oops, I did it again, their heart is becoming seared. They've lost the freshness of conviction. They've lost the meaning of true repentance that gets you back on your feet. Repentance does not put you down. Repentance always lifts you up. Can you hear what I'm saying? It's important that you and I understand dead flies cause a stench in the mixer's uh, anointing oil. The mixer in our case is God Almighty, the Holy Spirit. He's given us an anointing. And so that fresh anointing is from the Holy Spirit. And so it's important that you and I get a hold of this. Now, when the touch of the Holy Spirit comes though, wow, how everything wakes up. You know, this is why some people, they, uh, they just live in the past of yesterday. I found a story that I'd like to share with you. True story of Queen Victoria. Because this is going to demonstrate how sometimes a person loses their freshness because they become tainted. Now be careful because it's important. Now, now she is the governor's and, and superior governance over the Church of England. She was uh, Queen of England. I'll go back and give you her story in just a second. And it's important that you understand she grew up religiously. She, she knows about Christ. She has responsibilities over, the, again, the Church of England. That being said, you know, so close and yet so far. True story begins like this. In 1837 until 1901, Queen Victoria, as you see some of the pictures, ruled the British Empire. Her 63-year-old reign set a record in Britain only to be broken by her great-great-granddaughter, Queen Elizabeth II. Victoria's name came to define what's called the Victorian Age. Not long after assuming the throne, Queen Victoria fell in love with Francis Albert Augustus Charles Emmanuel. Wow, what a name. And she proposed to him five days after his arrival at Windsor Castle. And they were married on February 10th, 1840. Queen, the queen wasn't really fond of pregnancy. Um, she thought apparently uh, that newborn babies were ugly, yet they ended up having nine children. What a picture as you can see there. The, the royal couple had been married 21 years when Prince Albert contracted typhoid fever and died. At that point, um, Queen Victoria entered a period of profound grief and sorrow from which she would never recover. She had Albert's room turned into a shrine every day for the rest of her life. She had uh, linens on Albert's bed changed, her clothes, his clothes laid out, and a basin of fresh water poured out for his morning shave. She even slept with Albert's nightshirt in her arms. Now, we understand when a person has lost, a little bit of us always goes with them in that sense, but Queen Victoria stopped living altogether. They called her the widow of Windsor. Rarely did she leave the palace, and she always only wore black for the rest of her life. You see, Queen Victoria died on January 22nd, 1901, but she stopped living the day that Albert died, December 14, 1861. That is, if you do the math, 14,283 days that the Bible says you and I are to seize life and live with a fresh anointing. Well, Kind of reminds me of what Albert Einstein once said. He said, the tragedy is what dies inside of man while he's still alive. You know, I, I wish Queen Victoria was the exception to the rule, but she was tainted by a loss, and we could all understand that. And, um, and we understand that there are things in our past that happen to us, but we must not become a prisoner of our past. You know, oftentimes people become prisoners of their past mistakes or their past hurts or their past offenses and they never get out of that prison. We all experience the unfair difficulties in life. Not one of us is going to ever be able to escape that. So how do I come out of that? You know, I'm not making fun of Queen, uh, Queen, uh, uh, sorry, Queen Victoria. What I'm helping you to understand, here there were people around here that, that had probably read the same scriptures I'm reading with you every day, but it never was a reality. And I want you to understand, it's not just enough being religious, showing up to church, going through a ritual, going through a routine, but having no life. 
You don't want to lose your freshness. You need that freshness to live. And uh, it was Oral Roberts who once says, life isn't always fair, but God is always good. Now, the good news that we have is that we can bury our past hurts and our past mistakes and habits and hangups. And the greatest news is that there is fresh oil for the church today. You know, I, I close with this. Queen Victoria owed it to her empire to keep on living, but she did not. To keep on leading, but she did not. She owed it to her children to keep on living and leading, but she did not. She owed it to Albert in terms of his legacy to keep on living, but, you know, she did not. She, you know, because she was living by a dead yesterday. She was imprisoned by a dead yesterday. You know, when we live that way, we do not only ourselves a disservice. We do those that we say we love a disservice because we never give them our best. How do you get out of that? I'm not denying the realities of life. I'm here to tell you that's the importance of understanding the fresh oil on your life. So you see, the anointing makes the difference. Say that. The anointing makes the difference. And that's why what I'm sharing with you is no light topic because I've seen a lot of people, you know, lose their freshness. The power of the anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit, when it comes, and it always comes when you ask for it, it freshens you, it awakens you, it quickens you, it invigorates you because it's not fleshly, it's not carnal, it's not about, you know, um, ethnicities and nationalities, it's about the spirit of the living God and the will of God for your life. The anointing can do what others, you know, cannot do. You need to understand there may be people in your life but they'll never be able to do for you what the anointing only can do. See, some of you don't really have that revelation, but I want you to get it in the name of Je help them, Jesus. Just jump them out right now. Now, listen, remember we were reading out of Exodus chapter 30, and the Lord instructed Moses, says, and the anointing shall not be poured on man's flesh. It shall not be poured. In other words, you know, you don't, don't treat this anointing oil with someone that has a disregard with it. Someone that does not honor, someone that does not consider it, you know, holy. And, uh, and also he said, and don't try to use other compounds. Don't try to get another substitute. You know, there's a lot of people today that are substituting the anointing and they've substituted the real anointing for, with entertainment. They start doing a lot of things. They substitute the power of the gospel with intellectual you know, presentations, which there's nothing wrong with the intellect, but it's not there to replace the gospel. You know, They've taken the name of Jesus out and put their own name in. They've taken the blood out and put their own power in. And they do all these things, and there's all these substitutes. What Paul said, there is the people, and I keep on warning you again and again and again, and they're here in Hawaii. Hawaii, they're here in the United States. I love Hawaii. I love the United States. I love the body of Christ. But there are a people that, as Paul said, that have left the simplicity of Christ and are preaching another gospel. They're preaching about another Jesus and they're preaching by another spirit. And it's not the spirit of God. It's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you it's time to know the difference. That's why the anointing makes the difference and why you and I ought to strive to stay fresh in the anointing of God. You know, Paul once said this, he said, he says, oh foolish Galatians, he said to them, you know, what you began in the spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? You know, a lot of us, we get used to church services after a while, the newness wears out of it. You get used to where the door is, to where people sit, to what you go through. You get your little routine. If you, sooner, sooner than later, you begin to find out you can pick up patterns that have no anointing on it at all. You know, you're no longer coming with an expectation. You're no longer coming with a joy. You're coming with more criticism. You're coming a little bit with more attitude, wrong kind. You know what I'm saying? But I want you to understand. But uh, it all began in the spirit. I know so many wonderful people uh, across the body of Christ. You know, as I've been able to go to other nations, I saw them, how they started in the spirit. They were leaning on. They were relying on. They were trusting in God. They were depending on God. They were 
pressing in for God. You know, they were pressing in for that anointing. They were asking God in intercession. They were praying for others, you know, but then they got used to things. They got familiar with things and and now they learn how to do things and how to get around certain things and how to go through and still look like you got it all together you got the outside but we don't have any strength on the inside and now we're depending more on the flesh turn your neighbor say I don't think he's talking about me but if you want me to pray for you I'm right here I'm here to support you so so Paul says in Galatians 3 3 having begun in the spirit are you now made perfect in the flesh a lot of Christians that are listening to me right now, and I, and I really pray that if you're here that you are listening, or that if you're online that you are listening. This is not a criticism. This is an awakening. If you receive it right, it's an awakening. You started off in the spirit. You started off with your faith. You started off with the prayer life. You started off waking up in the early morning hours. You started off, you know, getting up, going to bed late because you were in the word. You started off praying for people. You started off believing for the gifts. You started off believing for the power of the Holy Ghost. You know, and that's how things got started. You were so trusting God. And this is how you started your business. And then this is how you started your career. It's how you started your marriage. It's how you started your relationship. It's how you started your family. It's how you started your dream. And the list goes on. You know, they were connected to the anointing. They were connected to the Holy Spirit. They were connected to life groups. They were connected to good fellowship. They were connected to the ministry. They were connected to the church. They were connected to prayer. They were connected to intercession. They were connected to godly counsel. They were connected to discipleship. You know, and I want you to understand, and it kept the freshness on them, but then they got used to the pattern. They got used to the songs. They got used to seeing the same people. They got used to sitting most of you sit in the same place that you've always done because some of you get upset even though there's that COVID distancing you say like they're sitting in my seat Woo! you lost your freshness somebody but I just don't understand you see you gotta you gotta be careful that you don't rely on the arm of the flesh maybe God wanted you to sit someone else so you would hear better anyways Isaiah chapter 30 verse 1 through 3 says this Woe unto the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, that cover themselves with a covering, but not of my spirit, and uh, but that they may add sin to sin. Look at verse two. They walk to go down to Egypt, Egypt a type and shadow of the world. In other words, they make decisions, watch this, but they have not asked my mouth. In other words, they've not asked for my counsel uh, to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, Pharaoh type and shadow of world leader, and that they trust in the shadow of Egypt. In other words, yeah, 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 I go to church, but really where my life comes alive is out there. Watch your answers in verse three. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt be your confusion. You see, Jesus said in John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth or makes alive, but the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. You need to understand God wants you walking in the greatest strength that he made available to you. And it requires the anointing oil. When it loses its preciousness to you, when it loses its holiness to you, when it just becomes something you can mention and there's no reverence about you, there's no reverence about your words, no reverence about how you speak to your parents, no reverence about how you speak to whomever that is toxic around you. You don't even realize you're allowing death flies to, to get into your ointment you see we need to understand that the Bible calls Satan the Lord of the flies his name is Beelzebub the Lord of the flies and he always brings a stench with him and he's trying to mess with your oil and he wants to mess with you contaminating you he wants to twist you just a little bit not all the way in the beginning just enough you know some of you see a small little fly you say oh what can that small little fly do in the little dish of oil that i have the bible says it will cause a stench of foul order listen there are certain Christians, unfortunately, 
that don't want to get rid of the stench, don't want to get rid of the, the foulness of their attitude, the foulness of their right to speak any which way they want, the foulness of not setting a standard in their life, okay? They're probably not here. And so, but I want you to understand there is a stench about it. It can be fixed, but you know, some people are just dogmatically upset that you would even mention that they need adjusting. Don't, don't look at your neighbor right now. Instead of attracting people, they repel people. Instead of making uh, their marriage better, they make their marriage worse. Instead of you know, bringing the family closer, they cause more division in the family. Instead of bringing healing to people, they bring a dis-ease to people. Instead of bringing peace, they bring confusion. Instead of causing unity with people, you know, what they do is cause more division. Have you ever met a Christian like that? There's an anointing on them, but their oil has become putrid. They're anoint there's a stench about it. It's a wrong attitude, and you gotta be careful because they are gonna try to infect you. I'd like to show you how. You know, just the, it's interesting just to, uh, the mention of dead flies. I mean, who wants to talk about flies on a Sunday morning? Well, since you do, I'm gonna move on then. See. I want you to get an understanding about certain flies that you don't want messing with your oil, okay? Now, first of all, sometimes who messes with your oil, your anointing, is the Lord of the flies, another name for Beelzebub or Satan. We got that, we can resist him. Sometimes it's unchurched people, unsaved people who are just yielding to the Lord of the flies. And sometimes it's Christians who know better but play the game and don't change the tactics that the Lord of the flies is trying to get them to live in. And you gotta realize there's a setup for contamination that I wanna make you aware of that we're gonna to stop today in the name of Jesus. Can you hear what I'm saying? I don't know whether you knew this, but there is such a thing called the fly family. Not the sly family, but the, the fly family. And uh, the first one I'd like to mention to you, and I heard of this, I wanna share with you, and that is called the butterfly. That's right, they're part of the fly family. Look how beautiful, say beautiful. And, and uh, really, the, fly, the, the butterfly is ex in externally is extremely beautiful. It, it's, uh, but the interesting fact is, it's the weakest in the fly family. See, it looks beautiful on the outside or outwardly. It's very weak, though, internally. See, externally, every time one looks at a, a butterfly, you can see the gorgeous colors. You can see the beauty that God created, the wonderment of uh, the way it floats. But internally, it's devoured by these small bugs because it has no inner strength. It reminds me of the story of Samson. You know, Samson had great times where he did great and powerful and mighty things that we can all recognize. But it's that same Samson who put his head in the lap of Delilah. Come on, somebody, read your Bible. And so Samson, in essence, was a butterfly. You know, he was beautiful on the outside, but he was weak on the inside. Everybody probably looking at Butterfly Samson says, wow, what a man of God, look at him. What an anointing on his life. What a powerful, you know, mighty man of valor. You know, what a powerful example of walking with God. But the truth is, there was flies in his ointment. There was dead flies in his ointment. Someone said, oh my. See, there was something internally wrong with Samson. The second fly, there's only two boards I wanna share with you because we're not, high, we're not here to have a fly reunion, but um, I heard about this one. It's called the robber fly. And you can look all of these up. I mean, it almost looks like a bee. But anyways, the robber fly is an interesting fly. It does exactly what the word uh, it describes it. It robs, you know? It has big wings and it has, uh, you know, it makes a lot of noise and like a hissing, whistling sound. And what it does is it waits for the other flies to bring the food into a particular location. And all it does is sit on the side, you know, and when they go, it goes in and it robs the food. Robber fly, you know, and I want you to understand that. Now, I know a lot of robber Christian flies in the church, you know. The Bible says, will a man rob God? 
yet you have robbed me in the tithes and the offerings. But God doesn't leave that on a negative. How many of you know? He says, prove me now in this. If I will not bless you, make you a blessing that the nations of the earth would understand that I am Jehovah, your God. The third fly that I really want you to lock in on will be is the most interesting to me because of the characteristics. It's called the mosquito. Now, there's over 3,000 versions of the mosquito. Ugly looking thing, huh? But I want you to understand, how many of you have ever said, I got a mosquito bite? You know, well, you know, mosquitoes don't have teeth. And mosquitoes don't have fangs. But mosquitoes, what they do have is a long tongue that turns into a sharp, sharp needle. And it penetrates either an animal or a human through one of its pores. And its goal is to do nothing but suck the blood out. See, I think the mosquito's favorite sound is nothing but the blood. But the point I'm trying to share with you right now, I'm sorry. I had to try it. I had to try it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's bad. It's bad. They, they stick their tongue in another living animal or person's life. And they try to draw, try to take away the blood. The mosquito wants to remove the blood. Now, the blood of Jesus Christ is what I'm talking about. Now, of course, you understand that the Bible says in the book of Leviticus that there's life in the blood. And there were certain things that uh, in the Old Testament that we were not supposed to do with the blood and certain things we were supposed to do with the blood when they were making sacrifices. But it's the blood of Jesus that gives us our victory, right? So if we have the power of the blood, why are so many Christians with that same blood not walking powerful lives? Dead flies in the ointment. Let me, let me help you to understand that just a little bit more. You see, the Bible, the tongue that I'm talking about, that little thing that turns into a needle on a mosquito, you know, is very deadly to millions and millions of people. Did you know that millions of people die every year of, of uh, mosquito infestation, the parasites that they are? And truly, I mean, not tr this is literally what's going on. Millions of people die. This is, you can find it. It's just known information. Of course, I never knew it. But anyways... But um, the Bible says something about our tongue and how we use it and how we are to protect it. Because sometimes we don't realize that we let the tongue of others come into our lives and we open up our ears like garbage pails and we just receive anything they say and you don't guard the anointing on your life and you end up with a dead fly and you don't know why. Well, that rhymes. I didn't even know I'm a poet. Anyways, I want you to understand this, but also how you use your tongue. Because it's important. Because the mosquito, what it does is it comes and it pokes and it simply wants to draw the impact of the blood from you. Oftentimes, leaving you with a dis-ease or some kind of virus on your life or some kind of fever or infection on your life. Because it's, it's important that you and I understand that the tongue is a very powerful tool that many people in the body of Christ are not guarded against. For example, in Proverbs 12, 18, it says, There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the righteous promotes health. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, Death and life is in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 15, 4 says, A wholesome, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Imagine people dumping garbage into your ears or your eye gate. So you don't think that the internet can affect your heart. So you don't think you can be affected in your life. You don't think that by watching that program that you shouldn't be watching because it's affecting your spirit. It's not that you don't have a right to watch it. It just doesn't make right what you watch. But you need to understand. I'm not a legalist. But you got to be a protectionist. If you don't protect yourself, you're going to open yourself to all kinds of stuff. And you're going to be the first person that's complaining to say, you know, the blood doesn't work. The name of Jesus doesn't work when it works all the time. But if you're not, if you're not going to open yourself up to being ministered to, to protect you, I'm trying to get something to you. You see, it's important that it says sometimes we open ourselves up on the internet, whether it's pornography or it's other things, you know, or words that people say that are unsanctified and just, uh, just ungodly. 
It doesn't have to be immoral, but it can be something else. And it brings heaviness on you because that's what all that perverseness is. It breaks your spirit. It's trying to do that. It's an, an assignment against you. You see, there was a time... It says, and I apologize, it's in the book of Psalms. It says, for Jerusalem stumbled, and you know Jerusalem means city of peace. So it wouldn't say peace. And then it says, and Judah is fallen. You know, Judah is praise. I'm going to show you right now why people have lost their peace and why they have no praise. It goes, it says, for Jerusalem is stumbled and Judah has fallen because their tongue." Their doings are against the Lord uh, to provoke the eyes of his glory. You see, we've been told, we've been told to guard our tongue. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. And he that uses it shall eat by its own fruit. If you don't want to guard your tongue, you don't have to. But it's going to have an effect on you. I know we think sometimes, certainly not you, but sometimes I've, you know, you know, we think that we're a little smarter than God, that I can say whatever I want to say because I'm just being real with everybody. I'm just being honest with everybody. You know, I can watch that. I'm not under bondage. I'm not under the law. It's not that you're under the law, idiot. It's not that you're under bondage, you know, dumb one. You know, you need a revelation of what it's trying to do. You're looking at that thing through the eyes of your flesh, and God's trying to protect your spirit because it's the anointing that makes the difference. I hope I didn't offend anybody, but, but today you're going to get healed. Either way, you're going to get... See, a mosquito, a mosquito like sin is an infector. It's a contaminator. It's a putrefier. It's a stench maker. Mosquito simply means, it's a Spanish word, it means little fly. That's all it really means, little fly. And we think that the little things won't really harm us. The little gossip won't really harm us. The little backbiting won't really harm us. The little things that no one else sees will really harm us. Well, I'm here to tell you, you're not smarter than God, and he's given you a plan of how to stay strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And if you'll understand how to protect the anointing on your life, this is why we have a lot of young Christians. They fall out way too soon, and you think you're scratching your head. You say, man, they have so much potential. They have so much life to do so so much in life and they get sidelined they get sidelined they become just another statistic it's not that they didn't go to church it's not that they didn't hear the word is that you know they allowed their tongue or the tongue of others to influence them turn your neighbor and say now I know I'm about ready to lay hands on somebody you're the closest one to me so I, I found this little short paragraph it says arguably by a professional and an expert in this field of mosquitoes, it says, uh, arguably among the most dangerous animals on the planet, accounting for millions of deaths per year, these flying parasites have the ability to carry and transmit diseases to humans. You know, you've heard of the Zika virus here in Hawaii, yellow fever, and the list goes on, malaria, infecting hundreds of millions of humans and killing millions every year. We're talking about worldwide now. Why is that? All because of a long tongue. <laughs> Play on words. You know, how many times have we allowed our tongue to infect or to hurt or to damage by ridicule or by sarcasm or by judgment or by argument? You know, we, don't, we know what the word says, but we have to justify our feelings. And so we hurt that person in the relationship, be it a family or be it a marriage, because you're making yourself out, if you're a man, to be the macho, macho man. And you have the right to say, after all, the traditions of our fathers say, oh, I'm the man, but you're a stupid man. If you can't guard your tongue, because all you have is a long tongue and you're whipping everybody and you're hurting your children and you're hurting your spouse, you know, if you're, but I want you to understand the love of God covers the mosquito bites. Amen. I had to come to my own rescue right there. There was too much. But here's what you can do. Here's what David did. Now listen. David said, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth and keep watch over the door of my lips. Are you that careful? Do you guard your tongue? And do you guard yourself from the tongues of others? Can you say, hey, my ears are not garbage heaps? Well, I'm just telling you the truth. I mean, this is just what I feel. I don't want to know what you feel. 
I don't want to know. I don't have to get involved. So some of you, you, you feel obligated to every idiot that comes down your road and tries to cause you to be infected, and you just listen to them. And then you wonder, like, why am I depressed? Why am I so upset? Why am I so just, you know, the Hebrew word for upset is jacked up. You know what I'm saying? And uh, here's, here, here's what, this is a prayer that I pray, uh, Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4, almost every day of my life. It says, the Lord has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. You know what we often do? We go to the weary and make them more weary with all of our gossip and all of our trash talk and all of our this and all of our that. You know, we don't bring the word. We don't bring a fresh anointing. We don't bring what they need. We just pile it up on there. Well, I feel you're safe and I can tell. That's just an avenue for saying, I just want to dump on you. You got to be careful for people. You can be respectful and say, don't dump on me in a nice way, I suppose. Figure it out. Anyways, in James chapter 3, my last couple of verses, and I'm going to pray with you. It says, so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. And the tongue... Verse 6 says, is a fire, a world of iniquity, and sets on fire the course of nature, or how you live. And verse 8 says, for no man can tame the tongue. I want to stop right there. You can tame the tongue, but you can't tame it with just positive thinking, or just being uh, naturally minded, or human ability. You know, it takes the power of the Holy Ghost. And it's important that you and I understand so what I'm saying is sin and mosquitoes have something in common. They both attack to putrefy. They both want to take away the power of the blood in your life by tainting you. See, it's the blood of Jesus that, that um, draws us near to him. It's the blood of Jesus that of Jesus Christ that has forgiven us of our sins. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that has washed us of all unrighteousness. It's the blood of Jesus that gives us the power to overcome. But it's also the blood of Jesus that made a way for the anointing oil to come into your life. It took you and I being saved through his blood, his victory over death, hell, and the grave. So you can say, I'm washed clean of my sins and I've received forgiveness from Jesus Christ. You know, instantaneously when you were born again, that anointing came upon your life. But the enemy knows what the anointing could do. And I want you to understand this. The anointing will destroy the oak. Did you know that? The anointing is designed to destroy the oak. Isaiah 10, 27 says, and it shall come to pass. In that day that his burden, this is a prophecy of the Messiah that's coming and what he's going to do to Satan when he defeats him through death, hell, and the grave. It's not just a cute little scripture, but listen what it says. And it shall come to pass in that day at his resurrection that his burden the burden of the oppressor, uh, Satan himself, will be taken away from off your shoulders, from having to carry the burden or leaving burdensome or living <clears throat> with weights in your life. And his yoke, the yoke of the oppressor, you know, the yoke is what goes around the neck and tries to control, dominate, manipulate which way you go, you know, and what you can do. He says that yoke, will be uh, from off your neck will be destroyed. The yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Say because of the anointing. Say the anointing makes a difference. So the sin of the tongue like a mosquito is trying to contaminate the power of the blood. Now the power of the blood has always had, will always have power over any sin. But if you don't know what the little Lord of the flies is trying to do to you. And sometimes why all these people all of a sudden speaking to me about all these kind of things. It's trying to lift the power of the blood, contaminate the anointing on your life. And that, that's why it causes disease and death in families. That's why it causes disease and death in marriages and, 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 and in children. You know, spiritually speaking, not naturally always. In our businesses, in our dreams, and in our hopes. See, but if we allow ourselves to be intentional, to be purposeful. If you're not gonna be purposeful and resist the devil, 
so that he will flee, it's going to cause a breeding ground in your life. And that mosquito is going to lay its eggs. And it's going to reproduce more and more because you are not removing it. You're allowing the dead flies to stay in the ointment. And you can't. It's like, what it is? You know, what, 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 am, I, what am I not doing? Sometimes it's the simplest of things. And I want you to understand that today, God wants you to remove the dead flies. Here's what I'm talking about, mosquitoes, and I close with this. This is my th third close. You know, the question is, if, if we weren't intentional to keep sin out of the church, what do you think, you know, uh, the church would look like today? But here's the more important question. What would your home look like today if you don't get the mosquitoes out of your home? What, is your, what do you think your marriage would look like today, your family would look like today, or your life would look like today if you don't intentionally fight against the mosquito bites? Now, we can't, in this world, you can't stop all the mosquito bites. You know, every now and then we do get, you know, okay, I can use the word bites, right? But uh, this is because you understand what I'm talking about. But you don't have to become the smogest board. As soon as I get bit, I put the ointment on it. You know, I'm here to tell you what you can do to make sure that mosquitoes don't come around you is you got to stay connected to the anointing. You got to stay connected to fellowship. You got to stay connected to the church. You got to stay connected to discipleship. You got to stay connected to your life group. You got to stay connected to the word. You got to stay connected in prayer. You got to stay connected in fasting. You got to stay connected in li holy living. You got to make these simple decisions. That's like the incense. You don't need spray repellent. You just need to stay connected to the anointing. And that anointing, I'm here to tell you, will cause you to always be aware. It will teach you. It says, ah, that's a mosquito that's coming to cause a disease. And you say, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over you by the blood of the Lamb. I overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the Word of my testimony come on somebody let's all stand to our feet right now because I run out of time because you listen slow <laughs> I want to pray for you as we close out and uh, father in the name of Jesus as the singers get ready say there's nothing but the blood say nothing but the blood oh the blood of Jesus how powerful the blood is father I come before you right now and in the name of Jesus, I begin to pray for all of those online. And I begin to pray for all of those that are present here. That, Father, this would be a morning of fresh oil. Father, even David, when he was weak, he said that you exalted him like a wild ox. A picture of magnificent strength because you anointed him with fresh oil. Father, I want to thank you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That today, Lord, we have the ability to ask you. We come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy. Find grace to, uh, to help us in a time of need. And so, Lord, we want to just come to you and say, Lord, if there's areas in our life where we've allowed the dead flies to just exist, to become a breeding ground, Father God, in our hearts and in our minds, we repent of that, Lord. Lord, if we've not been protecting the anointing on our lives, but allow any old dead fly with a stench and a foul tongue come, Father, and try to infect us, Lord, we repent of that. Lord, today, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Lord, I pray that you would take the horn of your anointing oil. Father, and as you anointed David in the midst of his brothers by the Spirit of the living God, Father, it so transformed him that he said that the Spirit of God from that day forward came upon him to rule and to reign in a completely different way. Father, it's the anointing that makes the difference. If we've not regarded the anointing, Father God, as something holy, as something pure, as something righteous, if we've played with it, not honored it, Father God, played with temptation and not stood against it, Father God, we ask for your forgiveness. Lord, there's power in the blood. I want to thank you that we abide in that anointing. We want that fresh anointing. Say this after me. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you now, grant me right now a fresh anointing to come on my life. I regard your anointing, the power that I need. Lord, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus, to anoint me afresh, 
to anoint me anew, if I've become stagnant, if I've allowed dead flies to God on my anointing, I'm asking you now, forgive me. I lift my hands to praise you and I thank you for the power of the blood. Come on, lift your hands and sing this song and then we'll close. Anointing fall on me. Anointing fall on me. And let the power of the Holy Ghost rise up in me. Anointing fall on me. Come on, here we go. say I receive that anointing I receive that fresh oil upon my life for my family my finances my relationships my marriage everything I set my hand to do I will remember the anointing makes a difference in Jesus name Amen. Amen. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you so much. Don't forget to sign up for our men's event. Champions. It's going to be awesome. God bless each and every one of you. Shalom.